Hey everyone, welcome to Plasma Call Lucky 16. Um, today is going to be a fun, fun time. We've got two new constructions, Plasma Cashflow and Plasma Leap. Um, yeah, and some, a couple, I guess, new people on the call too. Um, let's dive right in. Dan, do you wanna, do you wanna kick us off? Yeah, so, so I'm super excited for, for Carl's been working on the spec for the new thing, Plasma Cash Flow. And um, let me tell you that uh, after Plasma Cash Flow, Plasma Cash is Plasma Trash. Plasma Debit is Plasma Forget It. Plasma Cash Flow is Plasma Cash for fungible tokens. So I think that's, I think that's basically what, that's, that's what it is, is that it, it's, 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 it's um, a more generalized form of plasma debit where you can have channels um, with, instead of just with the operator with anybody. Um, and yeah, and this also, this also, I think it also um, comes out of, of really was what Vitalik was working on the past couple of weeks about um, defragmentation of plasma cash. And I think it, it, uh, um, it sort of is that. So yeah, Carl, do you want to, do you want to talk about plasma cash flow? Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, Plasma cash flow for me it feels like kind of a better understanding of what plasma cash was doing, um, and I guess well we'll we'll get into plasma plasma leap soon because I feel bad just jumping right into plasma cash flow. We're good. Okay. Well then, let me share my screen, um, and we can talk about this new construction. Um, and this this is very much a work in progress document. Um, and hopefully I don't have anything embarrassing in the, my, my tabs. Um, anyway, all right. So let's see, there, there are two transactions. So one of the things that we, that we, you know, were able to do, um, actually let, let me, let me actually say the, this is basically a, a work, uh, that is done like based on Vitalik's work, based on, you know, a lot of Dan's uh, uh, plasma debit stuff and has and came out of uh, research jam sessions with, you know, Dan, Kelvin, Ben, uh, Hayden, you know, over the past you know, couple of weeks. Um, so thankfully we have two transaction formats. We finally actually have a spec that has a swap. That's very exciting. Um, definitely please stop me if, if I, if you ever want more information. Um, sends are pretty simple, right? Uh, but this, this start and offset is kind of where, where it gets interesting. Um, because in plasma cash, we have these, our leaf nodes are all different, you know, tokens or coins. Um, however, in plasma cash flow, we have the same denomination, just like with Vitalik's post on defragmentation, everything is one, you know, one coin denomination. And that could even be like something tiny, like, you know, I don't know, way, depends on, depends on, uh, it's really a choice up to you, um, what kind of resolution you want for your coins, for your fungible assets. This is like really plasma cash for fungible assets. It's funny, we started off with non-fungibles, now we have fungible. Um, so the transaction tree structure, let me actually get into the defragmentation section just because it's like kind of telling. Um, what happens is when you deposit, um, Actually, I've changed my mind again. Um, when you deposit, what happens is you get some range of tokens, right? So you get uh, uh, basically there's a list of deposits, you know, added to the next block. Um, you know, the token type this supports multiple different assets, and it's you know a start position, which will be the total deposits of the you know current uh, set of tokens, and an offset, which is just how much did you actually deposit? So if you, let's say, deposited one ETH and your resolution is, you know, way, then, or G way, then you're going to get, you know, whatever, a thousand or, or something um, uh, of, as an offset. Um, so then what we'll see is we can, like, actually, we can transact using this kind of range of coins. Um, and our transaction tree structure is pretty, pretty interesting. So we'll have a send, which sends, you know, coins uh, or tokens zero through three. And this, uh, they all have to be owned by the same owner. So like you, you send one range, you have to own that range. Technically you could add multiple signatures and, you know, send with multiple different owners, but you know, that would be up to you. Uh, that's this kind of like, I don't know. I, don't, I, I didn't feel like it was worth it. So I just assumed that they were all the same owner. Um, 
And then what you, and then what we do is we, we kind of like look at these transactions and we try to segment the, uh, uh, the, the, them into like the different ranges that they affect. Um, so we can really think about this as a, like a number line, um, which I don't know, Dan, Dan has, uh, uh, like, so for instance, I own this range and this range is maybe, um, you know, zero to three. Um, and then someone else is going to own this range of coins, which is, uh, you know, four to five. Um, and what happens is if I want to send this person some coins, let's say I want to send them, you know, two, two of my coins, what will ha happen is we will you know, overwrite the range and we'll say, okay, now there's a transaction, which, ha which, you know, now this is going to be instead of four to five, this is going to be, you know, um, two to five. And I'm going to have to use my eraser. This is, this, I didn't think this through, um, two to five. And this is going to be instead of zero to, uh, to two or three, um, it will be, you know, just zero to one, but now I have to find my, my drawer. Um, Let's see, zero, two, one. Okay, anyway, so what we wanna do is we we'll wanna split it into buckets because our Merkle tree needs to cover the full range of coins. So in, in, this, in this little example, there, the coins range from, like, uh, from zero to five. Um, however, uh, in, in, this, in this other one, we have a, a set of just 10 coins. And so what that means is we, we split it up into these buckets um, they're the kind of like minimal uh, segmentation required for uh, like adding these transactions. Um, I, I, I don't have the right, uh, the right kind of like vocabulary to express that. Um, but you'll, the reason why we have zero to two is because, um, sorry, I should, I think, yeah. Yeah, so this is zero and uh, offset three. So that means that there's, you know, zero, one, and two. So we split it into zero and two. Then three and five, there are no transactions, right? There's a kind of like a skip, a jump. Um, and then there's six, seven, eight, and nine. So this is where it got a little tricky because I wanted to throw in some like left, I wanted to throw in some crazy stuff where transaction two and transaction three actually overlap, but they're being included in the same block. Um, and so transaction two uh, references uh, coins six, seven, and eight. And transaction three references coins seven and eight. Uh, or yeah, seven and eight. Um, so what that means is this coin is going to be owned by whoever the owner is here, right? Because this send happened and then this send happened right after that. So that means that we have to split it into the seven and eight bucket. And then we have this ninth um, empty bucket. So once again, right, this, this is how, so we just like list, list them out, these ranges out, and we have a, an array for each one of them and we list the transactions. Right, and this is pretty simple. Just exactly what I said. And what we want to do is we want to preserve the same property that Plasma Cache has, where if we have a Merkle tree, we know exactly where the transaction needs to be included. And the way we do this is with a Mer Merkle sum tree, right? And this is thanks to Ben. Uh, uh, ben kind of came up with this a few days ago. Um, and what that means is, right, this is affecting coins zero through five, right? So then this com comes out to be six. Right, zero, one, two, three, four, five, blah, 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 six. Um, and then this affects coins, uh, you know, six through eight. And so there's, it's three here. And now we have a, we have a nine. We're just like building up a Merkle sum tree. And so let's say you have coin number six. Um, what you, what you would just end up doing is you would like, look here, you would say, okay, um, here's nine and here's, uh, uh, actually, there should be a one, right? There should be a one. Yeah. Whoopsies. This document I did, you know, 2 a.m. last night, to be honest with you. Um, so that should be a one. Um, so you, but you look here, you're like, oh, okay, that's, a, that's nine. So this is, uh, you know, I should look on this side. Um, then this is six and three. My, my coin is greater than six. So I'm gonna look on this side and then I can just find it right here. So we know exactly where it is. Um, now the issue with doing these kinds of ranges is you get into the problem of defragmentation or fragmentation actually. Um, and this is what uh, Vitalik talked about in his post. Um, and so what this, this basically means is uh, when we have a range of coins, 
the more we segment this range, the more expensive it gets to exit, right? The, the, I write here that the, the cost of exiting coins 100 through 500 is the same cost as exiting coins 100 through, you know, 5 million or 50 million. Um, but the cost of, you know, exiting coins 0 through 500 and then also exiting coins 1,000 through 1,500 is, you know, twice as much as exiting 0 through 1,000. So, so this is what we want to do is we want to have as many coins adjacent as possible. However, when you transact with someone, because you're converting your coins to their ownership, you get this, this property where um, the actual change in the total adjacencies, if you have no adjacent coins already, so let's say Alice and Bob are trying to transact with one another, but they're like in totally separate points on this kind of number line range thing, um, they need to, one person needs to send coins to the other and that produces an adjacency, right? So this, like the, the, co the cost, there is actually like a minimum amount that you would have to send someone to not create dust. Um, however, if you already have an adjacent token, then you are able, or, or token range, I should probably say, then you are able to, you know, just adjust your adjacencies, right? You're not actually creating anything. You're just uh, uh, like, you're already neighbors. So you're just moving where you end and where they begin, um, left or right. Um, and so, and then if you have multiple adjacencies, you can kind of like clean up your adjacencies um, if you send enough tokens. I don't know this, I, I, I didn't actually check this, uh, but so Dan, you can call me out if I, was, if I did that wrong. Um. <laughs> yeah, I think that's right, yeah. Okay, great. So, um, Transactions in this scheme essentially right. used to how we optimize this kind of uh, data structure then? I say that again? Uh, the goal in this uh, scheme then is to optimize the way that we do how we change the data structure in this uh, coin line in a sense? Yes, yes. These transactions, we want to make sure that the, yeah, the data structure in the kind of coin land number line is as, uh, you know, defragmented as possible, as, as contiguous as possible, um, for the yeah, reason. But, but to, to be clear, so this is, done, right, this is done by the transacting parties, is that when you have multiple adjacencies with, with some other party, when you transact, you will do it in a way where the coins get transferred so that now you've got sort of, you've, you've sort of defragmented your coins with respect to that party. Um, I think in practice, actually, you're not going to end up having like a bunch of different adjacencies with a particular party unless like there's a coincidence. Really, what's going to happen is the first time you transact with someone, you're going to move your coins to, to you're, you're going to you're going to acquire some piece of their coins that you're going to end up with one adjacency, some piece of one of their coins, so that you end up with one adjacency. And then when you transact with each other, you'll basically move that adjacency around by transferring some of your coins to them, and then they'll transfer some of yours to theirs to you. But your coins, your in total, won't end up any more fragmented. So you end up essentially with a number of, about the number of shards of different, of different coins that you have counterparties that, you're, that you've transacted with. Yeah. And something cool that we can do, well, actually, first, first there's a, an example of this right here, right? So there's Alice, Alice has four coins, Bob has, uh, what is that, six coins? Um, and, you know, Charlie has five. Um, so what we, what we can see is, well, oh, Charlie doesn't have five coins, sorry. Um, oopsies, Charlie has two coins. Um, so it's, let's say we start out with this state right here. Um, and then Alice wants to send three coins to Charlie, but notice that Alice, right, which is represented by these dollar signs, doesn't actually have any adjacencies with Charlie directly. And so what Alice is going to have to do is Alice is going to convert some of her coins, right? They're going to convert these three coins into Charlie's coins. And so now there is, you know, one new adjacency, which makes, you know, ex exiting these coins slightly more, you know, more costly than it would have been to exit all of these coins at the same time. Um, and so we end up with plus one adjacency. However, there is something cool that we can do. Don't, don't fear, y'all. Um, we actually have figured out, for the most part, these atomic swap transactions. And so we can do stuff similar to kind of like lightning, um, where we have... Um, hubs which facilitate the the creation of yeah thank you for that um, which make it so that you don't actually have to create adjacencies so let's say Alice once again wants to transact with Charlie Alice is going to instead of you know converting these three coins directly into Charlie's coins Alice will instead convert these three coins into Bob's coins and Bob will convert these three coins into Charlie's coins 
Um, and so we end up with no added adjacencies. Um, so this is a way like if there are kind of people who really want to transact with a lot of people, um, like maybe like hubs similar in, in, in Lightning, we may see just them facilitate a lot of these transactions. Cool. Um, so once again, we still have the same problem. This is just a kind of little weird section. We have the same problem that we do in Plasma Cache, and this is just the whole valid, uh, checking a transaction history. Um, once again, it's growing linearly. Um, what we, what you know, things that we really want to, it would be really nice to use CK Snarks. Um, we're gonna like that's a kind of area of further research that we really need to do to make it so that the the coin histories are significantly less. Um, burdensome. Um, also, there is like Plasma XT style stuff. There's also just like um, you can just, I, I guess, commit to the fact as an operator or that your blocks are valid um, and you'll like lose some deposits. So you get some like economic guarantee that the, the um, histories aren't, there are no invalid spends um, or double spends. Um, so, you know, that those are, these are just different ways, you know, similar to, to what we had before. Um, now the exit section, unfortunately, uh, is, is maybe not the, the, the greatest, it needs more diagrams. Um, but essentially we have the same exits as before. However, the only change is that you're just like, you're, you're, what you're challenging is just a particular token within a range. Um, so it's the same kind of challenge, it's the same real logic. However, you're just picking a point and you're saying this point is wrong. Um, and if you find one point that's wrong, it'll invalidate the entire exit. Um, and this is the kind of key to the uh, atomic swaps. So atomic swaps work just fine as, you know, transactions that you include in both uh, sections of the Merkle tree, both, you know, the, the sending uh, or person, you know, uh, Alice and Bob want to uh, swap with each other. Um, you put it in both coin uh, ranges, you know, Alice's coin range and Bob's coin range. Um, and it just generally works. The only issue is the uh, uh, block availability. So essentially, the operator, if the operator were to commit to a, 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 a you know, Merkle tree of transactions, but then not reveal what that Merkle tree is, we get into tricky situations where we don't know if the atomic swap actually happened. And so this is why we, we have this kind of uh, atomic swap force include. So this is, by the way, different from the force includes that we were doing previously um, in like limbo exits, for instance, where the atomic swap force include actually is uh, included at the moment that you send the, the, the atomic swap force include. So it's not like um, the block immediately after your last transaction that it's included. No, it's instead included you know, in the ordering of the blocks that, you're, that, that uh, already exist. Um, the reason why this is useful is because it allows us to essentially uh, um, like sh uh, discover whether or not the atomic swap was included um, in the transaction history. And then once we know if the atomic swap was included, we can then challenge normally like we would um, in you know any plasma cache chain. Um, so I need to like add some diagrams to this. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if you're like, oh, I don't fully, you know. Could you provide some more details on the signatures from phase one? Because ah, there is something written on this. Great, great question. Um, so there is a, a funny, a funky little thing. So these, these swaps actually have two phases of signatures and these are not committed on chain. These are not actually, you know, like confirmation signatures. Um, they are instead just two rounds of signing. So the first round of signing basically says, I am creating this swap and I accept the possibility that the swap will be force included. And then the second phase of signatures is, you know, I'm actually ready to do the swap and it can be included in the transaction tree as a normal, normal transaction. So the reason why we have two phases um, is because we want to prevent this problem where uh, you send, you are the second to last signer on the swap and you send it to your counterparty. And then your counterparty withholds that swap or you know, and blocks start going unavailable, then what do you do? You can't force include because you don't have enough signatures for your swap, but you also don't know if your swap has been included. Um, so you're just kind of stuck. 
or there's another problem. So we, we could allow any swap to force include. However, that means that you actually have to, uh, uh, you can like force people to send money um, with, with these swaps. So basically the first phase is like signing, I am okay with this, this uh, transaction, uh, this atomic swap. And the second phase is, you know, this is actually happening and, and can be committed to the main chain. Um, it's, you know, hopefully that makes sense. And, and so this is like in the case that if I have committed in phase one that I will sign and my signature is not gathered in phase two, I get penalized some way or? No, it's, it's, just, a, it's just that it can be forced included on chain. So someone can do something. Ah, okay. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but it can't be forced, it can't be included on the, on the plasma chain until you've, until you've got the signatures, so the, until you've got this phase okay. two signatures. So there the okay. idea is because when you, when you commit something on chain, you provide everybody with data availability, essentially. Like that's, that's something that we can do in the first round. Um, whereas, yeah. So, it's, so you know, I, I think, first of all, to be, to be clear, I think that the, the atomic swap protocol is a separate, um, a separate thing from the rest of, from the rest of plasma cash flow. And in fact, it's a prerequisite for having, for having a, a, a practical plasma cash flow, but it works very well for, well, it, or it should work if it works, it will work for plasma cash in general. Um, and, uh, and also to be clear, plasma cash flow is for fungible assets, but for, for non fungible tokens, classic plasma cash is still, is still, um, works, uh, exactly as well. Um, and generally and very, and very smoothly. So plasma cash flow is a way generally to get, to get sort of, um, divisible coins and, and, and fungibility, um, on plasma cash. But yeah, so I think, I think we'll probably, um, uh, we'll want to have a spec of plasma cash atomic swaps, um, itself, and then also have a, have a spec of plasma, plasma cash flow and its data structures and those things are kind of, yeah, so again, the atomic swaps are the requisite, but they're not, um, limited to only being used in cash flow. So if I were to summarize this, it would be plasma cash, but where every token is fragmented in very, very small denominations and the transaction format gets augmented in the sense that they give it a, a range of indexes, which specify how many coins I'm transferring. And this is it. That's what yeah, enables yeah. the transfer. Yeah, that's, that's right. And you could, but you could think about it. And the, the main issue was due to the, the main problem without atomic swaps is that eventually everything will get fragmented a lot and there's no efficient way to do it. While if we have the atomic swaps, we can use the people who are in between to make, uh, to make us have less, um, to make the fragmenting of the set easier. However, yeah. I would expect that um, basically at some point if two parties who are very far from each other uh, want to transact, they will have, uh, they will require too many, let's say hops in between. And by hops, I mean like the people who will need to interfere in order to provide the necessary swaps. No, so, so, so you'll always be able to send to any, any party on the plasma, on the, um, cash flow chain can send to any other party, um, whether they're on the chain or not. In fact, they can send to it. So we don't have any points yet in a single transaction with no participation from anyone else except the operator, including the transaction. Um, and all it will do is increase the total number of, uh, of like sort of separate coins or sort of token ranges um, by one. So, and then what you've done is you've, you've basically one of the coins that one of the parties owns has been split and that's creating an adjacency between these two parties. And then you just kind of can move. Now you have, when you, so I think, I think that's, um, uh, uh, that's sort of the, the basic concept there is that you is that all it takes is one of is one split and now essentially you can transfer as much of your balance as many of the coins as you want to the other party and at most you're going to be creating one additional coin total I'm, I'm basically curious. kind of like strategic merging and splitting sorry i'm curious where do you draw the line between what's more efficient to be able to split those coins or be able to transfer them in certain hops and like have you know people like hubs collecting fees have y'all thought about that Yes, I mean, I think that's, that's, it's sort of a second layer issue and it's something that I think, you know, is, is trying to figure out how to optimize is in the interest of the parties that are doing it. Um, but generally, I mean, generally, I think if you, if you are immediately adjacent to somebody, um, then just transacting with them will usually be the most efficient way. Um, if you aren't, but you're both immediately adjacent to some like liquidity providing hub, then transacting through them um, will be the second, is the second most efficient way. And then if you're not, then you can just do 
you create one adjacency by by transferring some of your coins to them or some pieces of putting one of your coins and transfer it to them um, along with some other coins. And again, it, like, like it, it turns out that all that does is, pretty, is basically it's treated as just like one split. And now you have an adjacency with that party, so any further transactions are efficient. So you can think about it kind of like, I think you think about Plasma Debit, uh, Plasma Debit chain as being a single like lightning hub, a single payment channel hub um, for routing payments. And a Plasma cash flow chain is a single payment channel network. It's something where anybody, where, you, where anybody can have you know, a, a channel that they can um, ad hoc create on this, on this chain, on the side, on the, on the, on the Plasma cash flow chain, create um, channels with anybody else that they want by moving these coins around um, and can transact using all of their liquidity that's on this chain with any of those parties. Um, very efficient, relatively efficiently. Um, so it's you know so so and and the nice thing about it is that you basically the way that this the way that this works out you automatically essentially rebalance with every transaction. Um, so that when you when you tra start transacting with a new party, it's like you just automatically sort of open a new channel with them. Um, so any further transactions with them are efficient, um, but it, in a way that doesn't actually limit your liquidity for transacting with other parties. So yeah, so I think I think this is it's it's. It's tough to get sort of an intuition for this stuff, and I think the um, we're working on making like diagrams for for sort of explaining this. But I do think, you know, like like mechanically thinking about it as a sort of in this granular way, as just a bunch of plasma cash tokens and you're referring to token ranges works. But conceptually, I think thinking of it as as continuous rather than discrete, and saying like what I own is this segment of this number line, and you know, like I'm just moving, the, I could move any, any amount, you know, here on this number line and give, and give value to them. Um, I think that's a little more, uh, yeah, maybe a little easier to think about. And just thinking about yourself as, as owning, as owning ranges of this continuous piece of value. Yeah, yeah. I agree with that. I, th I think it kind of like you're saying as similar to like virtual channels and like hubs and the lightning yeah. network, like plasma yeah. and everything. Um, Regarding exiting, I would assume that when we exit the token range, we, the Merkle proof is a um, subtree. Is that proof for a subtree that no, it, all the coins in the range are owned uh, yeah. by the same user? I don't, think, I, don't, I don't think it's a subtree. It's actually the way that the Merkle sum tree works is it's actually just a leaf in the tree represents that entire range. Ah, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th I was under the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I follow, I follow. Yep. Because I had Vitalik's original uh, right. proposal in mind, which would require the same thing. Okay. Right, but so Ben came up with this. Ben and Carl came up with this um, this different way to do a uh, the Merkle the Merkle sum tree too. So it isn't even like a sparse Merkle tree anymore. And now instead, it's uh, it's it looks it look like just a Merkle tree, but with the interesting property that you can still verify. From the, from the do we also have do non-inclusion proofs also apply in this one? Yeah. Yep. Um, so for a non-inclusion proof, you would just show you show the the part of the tr the part of the tree where you get to show a part of the tree where there's a like a, an empty range. So like it, it's a leaf in the tree here actually, um, and yeah, it, it just sort of says it'll just say empty for this particular range, and you can just verify that that range includes your coin. Right, but how would we tell that the range is empty? Like for example, in current sparse Merkle tree implementations. What is being used is the hash of zero, for example. Yeah. While in this case, in this it'll in this it'll be a the leaf at that point in the tree will be a start point, an offset, and just like some signifier empty. Okay. Okay. So so it 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 does have the offset inside. That's what I had in mind. Okay. Okay. And this does. Correct me if I'm wrong, but this doesn't add up in anything regarding uh, the recipient being uh, online, right? The recipient has to be online to do all the necessary checks. Um, a recipient does not need to be online. If you, for the rebalancing to happen, the recipient needs to be online. Um, but if you're transacting, for example, if you're sending to a recipient who, isn't, um, who doesn't have any coins, uh, they actually don't have to be online. You can still do the same. It's just like Plasma Cash. You just do a transaction that splits one of basically splitting one of your ranges creating a smaller range that belongs to them and now the recipient owns it um, but for them to rebalance for them to, to sort of to, to give you some of their coins in exchange in order to, to sort of limit the number of adjacency changes etc um, you may want yeah uh, 
now that, now that I think about it, I'm not even, I'm not even sure it'll, it'll always be, it'll always be necessary for the recipient to participate in it. So I'll, I'll have to think about that for, for a second, but yeah. Um, but in general, yeah, no more than in Plasma Cache does the, does the recipient have to be online. Okay, I'm just thinking of general requirements that may change uh, because we don't want to add uh, any more data checking on the users. Uh, what about, um, what was it? Uh, when the challenges, they also are the same? Um, so that, yeah, so the challenges are the same. You need to add one challenge for, um, for dealing with these atomic swaps and that's part of the atomic swap um, proposal. And again, we haven't got that exact, we haven't got that fully worked out um, because it, it's a, this, it's simultaneously, it's a pretty, it's a relatively complicated game where it's simultaneously potentially challenging some exits. Um, and, uh, well, no, actually, no, I'm sorry. I think, I think, I think we've changed the center. Yeah. Anyway, it's a, it's a, it's, it, it's, it's a, you need to add this additional piece to the exit game. There's also, because of the ranges, you need to add a way to challenge, um, to say that a range has already been exited. Um, so if somebody tries to exit a range that's previously been exited, you need to keep track on the parent chain of all the exits of the ranges that have been successfully exited. Um, and if someone tries to exit a, a range that overlaps with one of those ranges, someone needs to be able to challenge it. This is just sort of one of the limitations of having ranges instead of having just a discrete identifier. This probably requires a lot of uh, storage on the contract. And uh, is there any way, for example, I'm trying to think of any way that, we, for example, if we have this data stored on the contract, if at some point it will become useless, if we can reuse it in the sense in a gas token uh, construction. So if we have some uh, exit data of the, from, the, from an old exit, that has been stored on chain. If that coin, if if we can be sure, so if we have checkpoints, okay, that may be one thing. So if we have checkpoints and we can be sure that any exit from the previous, uh, from from before has been exited and is invalid, uh, any on-chain storage that has been utilized for uh, storing the ranges, the exited ranges, which would be necessary originally for the challenges, we could reuse it and clear it up. Uh, when initiating uh, newer exits to in order to reduce the gas costs, does yes, that make sense? Okay. I think that's right. And, or you could allow, yeah, anyone would actually, I guess, be able to just ping the contract and tell it you can merge these two exited ranges, um, and like maybe, yeah, maybe get get, I guess, at least a gas reward from it um, from for freeing that that storage. So that's a, that's a, that's an interesting point. Um, so yeah, I think that I think that works. Um, yeah, uh, but I, I think. And ultimately, and I think this, is, this will be a more complicated thing, um, it should be possible to, for somebody to redeposit into one of those ranges. Um, but again, I think that's, I think that's, that's maybe, that's maybe going to be sort of challenging, so we'll see. But yeah, um, and you know, on, on chain, too, you could like Merkleize that. There's, a lot, there's, I think, a lot of ways to, to try to, um, to, to make that, that um, kind of extra state that needs to be stored more efficient. But it's a basic principle. But... By the way, I actually think you can use this um, Merkle tree structure for normal plasma cache chains, um, which is actually kind of cool. Um, so instead of these buckets uh, being just all, like most of them being ranges, um, each one of the ones that actually transact a coin will just be a single index, and then there'll be a range for all of the, trans uh, all of the no transaction ranges. Um, and then you can actually use the exact same kind of Merkle sum tree structure, um, but use it for plasma cache. And so this might actually be, uh, you know, a human. Can, can, you, can you repeat? Uh, you sure. Cut off. Can you repeat? Oh, okay. Um, so essentially, uh, note the the actual nodes uh, can be you know single ind indices. Um, so in plasma cache, right, we have only non fungible assets, and so what we'll end up doing is we'll just like say, okay. Um, on you know index my my coin ID ten um, has been uh, transferred, but then coin IDs eleven through twenty have not been transferred, and then coin ID twenty one has been transferred. And so we can use this exact same thing where you know we specify okay this instead of being you know zero to two maybe this is just ID zero, and then this is uh, you know two to five or, or, or one to five, um, and then you know this is six, uh, and this one's you know seven to eight. There are no transactions. Um, so in other words, you can use this exact same kind of like Merkle tree, uh, Merkle sum tree structure for, uh, you know, single token transfers as well as range token transfers. 
um, which uh -huh. may actually be preferable in terms of like the Merkle tree size that you get um, because this grows, uh, this Merkle tree grows um, with the number of transactions, like the, the, the depth grows with the number of transactions while with a sparse Merkle tree, you'll probably like hitting the max depth every time you actually have a transaction included. So it, it could be actually like a, a general thing for both plasma uh, and- uh, Okay, but generally the gas costs for verifying uh, Merkle trees aren't really the, the biggest issue. So yeah, okay, I, I follow your point, but maybe that's uh, not the biggest concern. Yeah. This will, this will also reduce the uh, proof of non-inclusion. Well, your tree is much uh, shallower, so your depth is maybe like uh, the log of the number of transactions in block uh, for every block, so your proof of non-inclusion is just shorter. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, um, this is cool, I can say. Yeah. Yes, so. Yeah, I think yeah. this is, it I think, solves the biggest problem with Plasma Cache. Yeah, I think uh, Dan can do his uh, line about the Plasma Cache again. Just the to plasma, finalize this part. Plasma Cache is Plasma Trash. Yeah. No, 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 really, really, look, guys, Plasma Cache is Plasma, and Plasma Debit is Plasma Cache, and Plasma Cache Flow is Plasma Debit. It's not that cool. Yes, I'm very yes. confused. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, do we have anything further to add on this matter? So I would assume I would assume that the section on atomic swaps it will get uh, slightly more detailed over the next few days. Yep. And did you perhaps get some implementation work on this? Yeah, especially of the um, the sum tree. Does that exist? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That, mainly that, because that is, uh, I think, the biggest part of the challenge, right? No Did work you, yet. Okay, the, the silence it's works. Coming. It's okay. coming. No work, yes. <laughs> we, were expecting, we were expecting Georgios to do it, so... <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Okay, I, I will do it. I know you just heard about it, but have you started yet? And when will you be done? And when I will do it in the next 30 minutes. Okay, <laughs> so... Uh, maybe we can hear Johan now on Plasma yeah, Leap. Yeah, I'd love to hear about Plasma uh, Leap. Ju yeah, just uh, one small apology. I will have to run right now. So before Johan jumps, because I did, uh, I gave him my feedback on his uh, Plasma Leap construction and a small concern about the storage token. Uh, we're starting a work and a GPU-based ZK Snack Prover. I posted the link with our initial resolution and architecture with more information coming. So if anyone interesting, I uh, can just uh, join us on the implementation side. It will be prover only. We will not be doing anything for a uh, setup part, which can be still run, uh, run once and use, uh, using the distributed prover uh, from the disk. Uh, also, we'll only focus on the proving part. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Uh, um, you, you also have this item about uh, more VP. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, th this one is just for general use. I'm, I try to put as much, um, well, I try to make a full contract which covers every case from normal exits to limba exits and to block invalidity changes and even the liquidity provision. And everything is tested. So you can just try run it, find the mistakes, uh, see, just check if there are discrepancies with uh, more viable oh. plasma. But I also did the um, explainer at the beginning of how it works for uh, more viable plasma implementation. So if you just, you can either just use it uh, with your own transaction structure with slight modifications. Uh, or just find some mistakes. Uh, just any feedback would be great. But, uh, it's mainly for my implementation, which I'm just finishing. Cool. We'll definitely compare to our more VP implementation. Looks interesting. Yeah. So if everyone, if anyone wants to do some uh, GPU computations, we will use the CUDA. Uh, just um, send me an email. Uh, we will join you. Coolio. Um, peep, peep, plasma leap. And that's all I could come up with. <laughs>
So, Alex, are you okay if I start on the next topic? I guess. Um, how do I share my screen here? Is that possible? I guess it is. So, yeah, you guys can hear me, right? Um, let me see where I am here. Fuck. So, uh, yeah. Uh, quick intro. So um, we got a little fund from the Ethereum fund, uh, a grant from the Ethereum Foundation, beginning of the year, and been doing some like computation research, and um, this is kind of the result of it. So um, what we've done is um, there was a Soli VM implementers call going on for a while, and it's still going on, so you guys can join. And that's what we tried to implement uh, a version of. A runtime EVM runtime in Solidity, so EVM in the EVM, and um, uh, the situation in that is actually that we can do we can verify very simple uh, contracts, very simple like on stack computation and stuff like that, as store as load and more complex opcodes like call data copy um, still uh, need to be done. But uh, you can see where this is leading. So if you kind of use a computation verification game and the Soli VM, you could kind of enforce off-chain computation, right? So uh, if you assume that as eventually possible, then um, we've spent some time thinking about how can we do computation on Plasma? And I'm sure you guys all read Kelvin's post on like what is hard about um, computation on Plasma. And maybe you've also read my why smart contracts on uh, Plasma are infeasible post. And it basically all comes down to the fact that if you have contract state, um, the transition of the state can kind of needs to be um, somehow part of the exit game or something like that, which makes things like incredibly complicated. And um, on top of that, if things don't have a clear owner, uh, then um, kind of the exit authorization. So who is allowed to exit the token um, uh, becomes very difficult and also the spending authorization. So let's say I have something in the exit and then someone um, else, for example, the operator who can also do state transition uh, on my contract because it's a sp anyone can spend kind of situation, um, can just spend from it and invalidate my exit. So. Um, this Plasma Leap proposal is kind of the idea to add computation without uh, changing any assumptions about the um, subjective data availability or uh, changing the exit game too much. And the way we kind of uh, dug into this is by just using uh, looking at uh, Bitcoin uh, pay to script hash. So I don't know if you guys remember that. Um, Bitcoin pay to script hash basically in the address you just provide a hash of the script and then the input has to bring the script and the data with which the script evaluates to one and uh, so it's basically kind of a condition for spending right and on Bitcoin the coins move kind of from condition to condition so we've kind of uh, we've done the same thing so we've uh, taken a piece of code that we call a spending condition and you can fulfill it or not. And um, we, so this is in the context of MVP, uh, just to make that sure. And then um, instead of just putting the address of the owner into the output, um, you can as well just uh, put a hash of a contract. And that contract is a spending condition. Um, and then the input uh, can bring the, uh, code of the contract, so the script, um, the data that fulfills the contract, and yeah, and create new outputs. And that way, um, yeah, what can we do that way? So um, the interesting thing is kind of, let's assume we have um, interactive computation verification games, then we can make sure that state transitions are correct from one um, output to the next output, right? But uh, the really difficult thing is if you want to exit such a thing. Um, so what do you do? 
uh, you take that same code and uh, you deploy it on the Ethereum main network. And ideally, in your spending condition, you have implemented a function that is called the exit proxy. And what does the exit proxy do? Well, it just kind of checks some kind of authorization again, because you don't want anyone to be able to exit your contract, right? So some kind of authorization. And then it just calls the Plasma contract. And it uh, calls the start exit function. So it kind of pulls itself out of the Plasma chain by its hair, so to say. And um, for that, we only need to modify the Plasma contract a little bit. And that is in the start exit function here. So uh, we parse the transaction, we do all the things. And then um, if the message sender is not the owner of the coins, then we basically just check if maybe the hash of the code of the contract that is calling us is the same as the address that the coins belong to. And that way you kind of, when you think you want to exit your smart contract, you deploy it on the main network first and then you exit the coins to it. And then you fulfill your spending fulfill your spending condition on the main network. Um, that's cool, uh, but if you've read my post on why uh, general computation or smart contracts on Plasma are not possible, then you also know that kind of the state that is inside of the contract has to be considered kind of invalid after any data withholding that has happened on the chain. So we've kind of just gone along and we said, look, uh, you can't use S store and S load in your spending condition because then we have to deal with state transitions and it becomes way too complicated. So spending conditions are only scripts. But um, if you can't use state in your contracts, they're not really smart contracts. Smart contracts with state is what made uh, Ethereum so great, right? I mean, we had scripts in Bitcoin before. So we've gone back and we introduced a thing that is called the non-fungible storage token. So the non-fungible storage token is just basically like a crypto kitty where you can change the color of the kitty during the lifetime of it. So there is one additional 32 bytes field and that is kind of like, kind of like a, Merkle, uh, a Merkle Patricia tree root. Um, and uh, you can read from it, uh, that doesn't help you. You actually need to verify that something is included in the chain. So we've used the Patricia tree implementation by Andreas Olofsson, just plug that in. And you can update that uh, Merkle root. And this way we kind of bring storage back to the spending conditions, so to the scripts. So now uh, these live as kind of first class citizens as non-fungible tokens in the MVP plasma chain. Um, and then I've created a bunch of, or oh, not a bunch of application examples, but application examples. So there's kind of a simple counter implementation that uses such a um, non-fungible storage to store something. And after you spend it five times, you can get your funds, so kind of useless thing. Um, and I kind of try to imagine a multi-sig wallet where three people bring an NFT, which kind of holds their decision whether they want to spend something from that multi-sig uh, or not. And that condition uh, only fulfills to true if kind of two of the, these three storage tokens hold an agreement. And yeah, now I kind of want to have feedback from you guys if you think that's any useful. This is, this is, this is, I think this is awesome. Um, and my, my first question, I think, is, uh, well, first, actually, are, are you familiar with the concept of covenants? No. Uh, cool, yes, yeah, so I, I would definitely I would definitely check that out. So in, in sort of the context of, of Bitcoin scripting, the idea of adding state fullness to Bitcoin script and, and, and UTXO-based contract models is usually called covenants. Uh -huh. um, and it works, it works sort of like that. And I think, for example, Handshake, um, that's how Handshake does smart contracts, essentially, is by, um, uh, uh, sorry, well, how Handshake actually does like sort of the, the property thing, the idea of, having, of, of being able to like own, own a particular um, namespace is, is, is by taking the UTXO model and then adding this thing covenant. So it's basically the idea, it's, you can sort of add an op code that lets you um, store state uh, on chain. My, my, so I, I also encourage you to check out um, 
Uh, I have a, a smart contract language for Bitcoin script called Ivy um, that we developed at, at, at my company. Um, you go, let me, I'll put the link in. It's ivy-lang.com, not to, uh, sorry, .org. Uh, ivy-lang.org, not to uh, self-promote here too much. But um, I, that, so that, that's, it's, a, it's a script that I think it works a lot like your spending conditions here in that it's, it's uh, got yeah. only a purely local state and does these sort of checks for um, doing, doing these withdrawals. It doesn't have storage because it doesn't have, because um, Bitcoin script, Bitcoin does not have covenants. So like you said, it's, not, it's, it's fully stateless. Um, yeah. And of course, there's, no, there's nothing to exit to in this in this context. It doesn't have that. But yeah, but I guess my so my my bigger question though would be, I think if you if you're designing a new chain and a new computation model, um, and you can start, you have like the vast infinite range of you know programming languages and VMs and computation contexts. Why retrofit it to make it solidity? That's a good question. Um, good, yeah. <laughs> so um, what we really wanted or uh, the, the difficulty was really the exit, right? How do you get back to the main network mm -hmm. and still kind of have it under the same spending conditions? So um, it needs to run the EVM currently if you want to scale Ethereum and your contracts need to be accessible back into Ethereum, then um, it must be EVM, no? Or you could have an, an on-chain virtual. You said you were working on doing an EVM implementation in Solidity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, to be like, but then if you're going to build that anyway, just do a different VM implementation in Solidity and just have an on-chain so, VM that'll execute, that can execute these scripts. Yeah, you could, you could do that with, uh, for example, Truebit. They use uh, WebAssembly, right? And that's right, done on. Right, but you, again, but you don't, I, think, you, I don't know. I'm not even, I don't even think you really need a, like, certainly WebAssembly is like way overkill. Um, yeah. like really for this mostly and like I you get it can get a lot a surprising amount done in Bitcoin if you have with just like basically you know this, this really simple set of opcodes you got like hashes you got um, uh, signature checks if you added concatenation and covenants you can get a lot more done um, and uh, like you know Merkle proofs arbitrary things I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm so I'm sort of a, I'm sort of a fan generally of smaller languages and cool. smaller virtual machines for these okay. things but, but tell me how would you do the exit then from plasma so yeah, so I mean, you can you can do an, a contract on the main chain that can execute this whatever toy VM language that you've developed, and then you can you can execute to a contract that basically depends. Right, we'll, we'll run that script on that. Ah, uh, okay. So you kind of run the whole script on the main network then yep. for the exit. Yeah, I think it's, gonna, it's yeah. Yeah, I think that's gonna be more efficient certainly than like re-implementing. I mean, well, I'm not well, sure, but yeah. The thing that we do is we just need to execute one opcode of the EVM on mainnet, right? Because we would only use that setup in when we want to challenge computation. And then you do the binary search, like in Truebit, to, you know, uh, to a specific opcode that wasn't executed correctly. And then you just execute that one. And we're already having a lot of difficulty just getting one opcode right, right. to execute. Yeah, yeah. That, 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 that sounds way harder, though, than just saying, we'll, we'll run, if you've got a wrong state transition, we can just simulate that whole, we don't have to do the Truebit thing at all. We'll just run the script. The full script. Okay. Yeah, if that is efficient right. enough, I see, I see. Yeah. yeah. Like, uh, yeah, that, that, and you only do one round. You just say, we're just going to run this script and we'll show that it doesn't execute to this, to this new state. And I don't mean... You know, so we, I, I don't think, I, I don't know, is it going to be turning complete? Like on the, is the, how, how sort of, are you going to have loops in there? Is that, is the plan is to have loops yeah. in everything? Yeah, yeah, everything okay. except uh, call, okay. opcode, s-store, and s-load uh, should yeah, be executed. Yeah. So, you know, I think, you know, so it's, I still think, I think I would, I would rather say like, let's embed a virtual machine, let's do a custom virtual machine embedded in the solidity environment and it can, it can do stuff like have to keep track of its own gas and like have plasma cache, but I don't know. This may just be my fetish for- Cool, I'll definitely check it out. Stuff. What's that? Yeah. I'll definitely check out the links that you mentioned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, make yeah, sure to kind of take that in. Actually, the documentation has a description of covenant, a little description of covenants. Uh, like covenants. Cool, yeah. thanks cool. for that. Yeah, that's my last. I think um, it's a really great project though and good philosophy, I think. Yeah. Yeah, um, the point that we're at is kind of, we have a bit of a test net running, but we can't enforce the computation yet. So that's what we'll do next. That is so cool. Cool, thanks guys. Yeah, give me <laughs> critical feedback in, on ETH research, please. Like, rip it apart. Yeah. <laughs> wow, this is so cool, holy, wow. 
Uh, I'm, I'm... So maybe I can make a question. Like, so you said you have a testnet. So perhaps like anybody that uh, writes uh, stuff and wants to like and has code that they want to test with other people who are in the same context, perhaps we could share the code and walk each other through, so that uh, we can get uh, some feedback on how the actual client impl implementations are also. Because getting the contract and the scheme together is okay, but getting the whole actual node software wor working is another uh, issue, I believe. So I'm saying this in the context because I'm also working on a full Plasma Cache client, which is almost done, I would say. So uh, it would be nice if we could like start sharing and like basically doing quality assurance on each other's uh, node implementations. Because this will end up probably being more complex, like I think Zhuangzi said it. This might end up being more complex than a lightning daemon. Absolutely. You could set up a small honeypot on your testnet that, that can be exited into the main network. Uh, there was one comment I recall in your thread that was uh, about Trubit, and you responded that there is no issue with uh, using Trubit, but uh, I, I do not really remember. Could, so, you expand, could you expand on that? Because you say that it's the computational Trubit, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Trubit proposes a, a bunch of things, right? So first, there's binary search on the... Um, the dissective the protocol where you find where the construction, yeah. okay? But then uh, Trubit talks about more than that. So Trubit says there is a verifier's dilemma, right? So as long as there is a solver and a verifier, the solver will never make any mistakes until the verifier goes out of business because there is no bounties to earn because the solver never makes a mistake, right? And then the solver is free to make mistakes and no one checks on him. And that is the incentivization the, layer of Trubit. Yeah, that is why, and that is where they add the random, uh, the random mistakes yeah. where you still need yeah. challenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, but, yeah, so, but you can't use this incentivization layer. You kind of have to think in the context of Plasma here, right? So, who would challenge the operator? It would be the user of or the owner of the funds, right? That the operator just tries to do an invalid transition on. So the question is like, okay, if you have like a big deposit in Plasma, you will for sure challenge the operator. But if you just have five bucks on Plasma and the operator does an invalid transition to steal them, will you really play like 20 rounds of Trubit verification game uh, to get your five bucks back? Maybe not. So the question here on the incentivization layer is more like, how do you protect the long tail of small funds? Because the verification game is actually quite complicated. Um, because people with low funds, they do not have enough money to actually play out the full verification game. Oh, they just don't care enough. Yeah. Okay, okay. So to be a little hand wavy with this, couldn't it be possible to add some kind of lending protocol um, to work on top of this so that if a user does not have enough funds, but he knows that he will win the challenge, uh, that he borrows the money, he wins the challenge, and he get, gives the money back. Is it possible to do that? This is a more general question regarding bonds, I guess, and the costs on chain regarding challenges. Yeah. Um, I think it just the incentive of like getting a big part of the stake of the operator might already be enough, um, but it might not be enough to incentivize the human to kind of be aware of that it's possible and download the client software to do so. So I think it, a better overlay layer would just be a proof of stake plasma chain um, with a token and then the operators check on each other because they're kind of put into an economic union. Um, yeah, but that is open in this kind of research. The incentivization needs to be adopted to Plasma. Yeah. And one more question, unless somebody else wants to ask something. Cool. Uh, so isn't how you exit the state of uh, from Plasma uh, essentially similar to how counterfactual channels, they exit the state and they continue playing the game on chain? Yeah, that's exactly kind of the same exactly thing. The same. Okay. Except, and yeah, also you shouldn't have any state of the contract, otherwise that's way more complicated to exit. Right. Could, you, could you perhaps make it so that 
it's not necessary to withdraw the whole state. So it's actually possible to withdraw, play one step, make sure and force the valid state transition, and then go back to the chain, to the side chain. Mm -hmm. Essentially not playing, if, if you have to go to court, you go to court just for this dispute, because there is no point, there is no reason to keep going to court for every subsequent state. Um, so you can, uh, it could be that you just want to exit a contract for the sake of exiting a contract because you want to do something else with it, right? So then you would um, go through the whole exit procedure. I think you are talking about the fact when you want to challenge an invalid state transition, right? So, um, I don't know, like, um, if you have an invalid state transition, that invalid state transition can be used to cancel your exit, right? So I think you need to play the game to its end to prove to the plasma contract that the state transition is invalid and that it cannot be used to challenge an exit. Um, I think the plasma chain could continue running uh, after you've challenged such an invalid um, transition. Um, especially in the context of proof of stake, if you have multiple validators and they can uh, propose parallel blocks, you would just slash a block that is invalid and everyone would continue the chain on a valid chain of blocks. Um, yeah, but this write down we just wanted to do in the context of Plasma and not extend it with any other stuff on top, like you know, proof of stake or other security measures to really be able to expose kind of the weaknesses um, that there are. Could we have some feedback from uh, Felix on this? Because uh, I believe that the Gnosis team has been working on similar stuff, no? I see Felix in the call. Yeah, wait, I'm not in a position where I can talk very well, but... Um, ah, okay, okay. It's fine, it's fine. I actually... I I haven't fully read the, the research post, but I'll do that after the call. Um, and it definitely sounds very interesting. Yeah. Cool. Cool, yeah. Any, any other uh, questions, comments? This is very exciting. May I suggest that uh, in the next call that we get the, the whole snark team, like the people from uh, the Barry White Hat uh, roll-up repo, because I've been talking to them uh, sometimes in the Gitter and there's pretty amazing work being done on all sorts, on all ends regarding snarks and plasma and everything, which is a bit more future oriented, I guess, but it would be nice to see what's going on, how and what we can get in whatever time period. That is a fantastic idea. I think actually like the, the biggest thing now is, is a snark on each block feasible? Um, because that just makes uh, it, it, it that you know basically solves our transaction history problem, um, which is so so important. Um, so great idea! I will I will reach out to people. Cool. Well, any any final final things? Did we miss anything? Yeah, actually, Barry just posted something on Eve Research twenty three minutes ago with um, snarks about off chain state. And, and trying to read it, it's interesting. Could you post a link? Ah, yeah. Th this is what has been. This is what's being worked on for the last like two weeks, I believe. Yeah, I'm. I'm sending. Yeah. Seventeen thousand transactions per second. Woo. Bye, 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 Vitalik. <laughs> Five hundred transactions. What? <laughs> No, the state is off chain. Well, um, I haven't read fully through it, but he says the state, um, a lot of state is off chain and is, is subject to. Um, yeah, but if you add if you add the uh, events, you can put uh, parts of the state on chain. No, events are not part of state. Sure. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I not expect. But you can make them. Uh, yeah. Okay. But you can make them part of the database that is being passed on, around. No. Yeah. 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 Sure, but that limits the transactions per Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's you give and you you give something, you lose something.
Hmm. Cool. Well, I guess we're about time. Thank you everyone for, for the lovely call as always. Um, that was so much fun. Plasma, plasma is real. Let's, let's, let's get this main net. I'm so, I'm so, I'm so excited. We will. <laughs> All right. Well, see everyone. Ciao. <laughs> Bye guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>